Do you want to see an example of sunk cost fallacy? Well, I am all in on getting the most out of my Prusa XL. Today, we fit and test a community designed enclosure. I realize that not many of my viewers will own a Prusa XL, so I invite you to just sit back, get your popcorn, and see how much money and effort it takes to get the most potential out of it. In this installment, rather than pay top dollar for the official enclosure, we instead choose an option that's less than a quarter of the price. Before we start, a quick correction from my last XL video, where I complained that Prusa Slicer was missing a button from Orca Slicer, where we can add additional plates and then save everything in a 3MF. While it's true the button is missing, the functionality is there, but you have to drag an object off to create a new bed. Not intuitive, but still my mistake, so I apologize. Let's move on to Prusa XL enclosures, and the official one is 649 US dollars. And yes, it is true that if you bundle it when you buy the printer, the price drops to 520. The enclosure wasn't released yet when I ordered my printer, so my only option is to pay the full price. But this is a little bit unusual, both in appearance and functionality, considering you can't see inside the printer from the front while it's printing. And there are plenty of other quirks, as shown in this video from Robert Cowan. After previously watching that, I wasn't so sure I was interested anyway. And that brings us to a community alternative with the enclosure with an XL by Voxel 3D Netherland. By comparison, to me, this was very attractive, with a bunch of different users and a much, much cheaper price to build it yourself. For me, this one has a lot of appeal, as you can see completely inside the printer. It's got an extensive user manual going through the entire process to print and put it together. And there are a lot of remixes available to customize the parts and add things like the Prusa Buddy camera, filtration and all sorts of things. Now the files for this are completely free, but I was happy to pay for the design file version to receive the Source Step and Fusion 360 files if I wanted to do my own remixes. Now much of this design you print yourself and you can individually source all of the hardware if you like, but instead I chose to go on AliExpress and buy the panel only kit. This comes with the polycarbonate panels and all of the hardware required, as well as a humidity and temperature sensor. Alternatively, if you've got a bigger budget, you can get the printed parts included as well. But I stuck with the cheaper option, and this parts kit plus postage and the design files cost me 223 Australian or 147 US dollars. So for me, it is absolutely one quarter of the price. The only expense I haven't included here is two spools of PETG to print the parts as I get mine for free from my long-standing filament sponsor, X3D. From what I've seen, the official enclosure is not very straightforward to install, so how does this one compare? Before starting my manufacture, I chose to browse through the makes and comments since there are so many. With a project this popular, you can get a good sense as to what might be tricky and if any remix parts are required for the best fit. With that in mind, a few people said that the pre-oriented plates were not necessarily the latest version, so instead I decided to import the SDLs one at a time, following this guide in the manual to make sure I covered all of the parts. However, there seemed to be a plate missing with the left-hand version of these parts in plate 2.0, unless that's what plate 2.1 is meant to be. Beyond that, this was a great guide to make sure I had everything in the right quantities and applied support material where necessary. And for any parts that needed support, I use PLA as the interface layer, meaning that the support material would peel straight off and leave a great surface underneath. But before printing any of these large parts, I ran the shrinkage test that is included with the files and found that just as predicted, these parts had shrunk almost half a percent. And I ended up making a video on how to test and correct for this, which is linked in the description. Once corrected, the parts looked pretty reasonable, printed with a 0.25 millimeter layer height. However, some of them with steeper overhangs did not cope well at this layer height, so I reprinted them at 0.2mm, which gave a slower but cleaner result. We'll begin our assembly with the unboxing of the AliExpress kit, and everything arrived in good order. As advertised, we have the digital readout, all of the required hardware, including heat set inserts, and of course the polycarbonate panels wrapped in protective plastic. As you can see in the manual, there's quite a lot of threaded inserts that need to be melted into position. You can use a soldering iron or a specific tool like I'm using here, the kit from Naomi Wu, linked in the description. There's quite a lot of threaded inserts that need installation, pretty much where every hole is, apart from some of the holes that have a cavity behind that gives a bolt and a tool access to be inserted. 
From here, we start to follow the step-by-step -step build instructions. And this is made easier because all of the parts have embossed in them the part number as well as an arrow so you know the upwards direction. Most of the steps are simply mating up two parts and then screwing them together using the provided bolts into the threaded inserts. The frame by its nature will be pretty wobbly until the panels are bolted to the outside. The AliExpress panels by the way are also labelled with their name to match the instructions. The first component to come together will be the lid assembly with the lift up front door. And for it and several other components, we have some magnets that get super glued in. In this case, it's to hold this lid piece to the Prusa XL frame. And later on, we have smaller magnets that are glued in place to help hold the doors shut and stop them from rattling. At this stage, I run into a fitment issue with the lid, and that's that the parts didn't quite sit flat when they were bolted together. The cumulative effect of this is that the lid skewed out and didn't quite fit the top of the frame. I hoped that the magnets would be strong enough to flex it inwards, but that just wasn't the case. Now fortunately I had paid for the version with the assembly and step files included so I was able to design this simple little part that bolts into the upper extrusion and has one purpose, holding my skewed frame upwards at the correct width. I've released this remix on printables for anyone else with the same issue. Fast forwarding, the lid also didn't seem to sit far enough forward to match the doors but that was just a me problem as I had the antenna still up in the way and once it was temporarily folded out of the way the lid sat in the exact position that was intended. Moving on to the side panels and front doors, there was a lot of discussion in the comments about how the doors didn't align and a remix part was needed. So to find this out, I did a lot of dummy fitment. As it turns out, the latest revisions have a slot instead of a hole for one of the mounting points, and that allows some horizontal adjustment to get the door panel gap where you need it. So no remix part required anymore. This part of the enclosure is quite simple. We remove some strips from the 3030 extrusion, prep some bolts and T-nuts in the holes, install the printed part against the factory frame before tightening up the bolts, install the adjustable piece in the front corners, and this step was fiddly because it won't go in with the T-nuts in place, meaning you have to slide them into the channel afterwards. Difficult, but doable. The polycarbonate panel goes in, which will set the correct distance between these two. It's secured at each end with another line of bolts. The doors are then hung, and things like handles are attached. And there's a few smaller parts that go to the frame, holding magnets and helping seal up the gaps. And once you're happy with all of your panel gaps, you can then go back and tighten those bolts holding the corner frame pieces. And that's the enclosure done. We have great access with two doors swinging open from the front. And then optionally, we have a front lid that hinges up to the top and holds itself in place. Of course, the whole lid assembly simply lifts off if you need to. I think it's a nice looking design, particularly at night with the factory XL LEDs inside. In terms of hardware, I generally had enough with spares for most components but there wasn't enough M4 bolts and T-nuts, so I had to use some from my existing components. There's also not a spot for this readout to go, so I'll have to explore the remixes and probably laser cut out a rectangular hole for it to clip in. A bit fiddly in places, but overall not too bad. So how does it perform? Firstly, a volume test. I don't want it to see if the printer was quieter and if any new rattles and noises were introduced by the enclosure. The answer to both of those was no. You can see the front door wobbling, but it's not enough to make any sound. And the XY steppers are already outside the enclosure, so it makes sense they won't be reduced in volume. Next, some temperature tests, with an ambient temperature in my room of around 15 degrees. I started with a simple static test, setting the bed manually to 100 degrees. With a thermocouple poked inside the front of the enclosure. After 10 minutes, the internal temperature had risen to 38 degrees Celsius, and after half an hour, it had capped off at around 43 degrees. A better real-world test is to measure while printing, and an hour or so into this ASA print, the internal temperature was steady in the low 50s. But what effect does this have on printed parts? The upper piece here is a shrinkage test for ASA that I printed a week ago. As you can see, the edge is curled up, caught the nozzle, and made a mess of the top infill. The reprint with the enclosure is much improved. As you can see, the top surfaces are uniform the whole way to the end, and when sitting on the bench, there's nowhere near as much warp as the version printed without an enclosure. Let's step it up with my warp test, which truly is a torture test. With the lid off and the doors open, we can see the edges curl up, ruining the top surfaces, and there's a visible bend to these layer lines as the part distorts during printing. A ruler really shows off how far from flat these surfaces now are, and we can see artifacts on the underside where the edges have lifted up bit by bit. The enclosed version has much cleaner upper surfaces, on the edges at least, 
and the ruler test shows some warping, but it is dramatically reduced from the first version. So already a big improvement, but there are things we can do to get it even better. Low hanging fruit is adding some foam sealing tape to some of these gaps around the openings, and I'm thinking about remixing a printed part to seal this gap just above the LCD. Probably the largest gains will be made by sealing up these hexagon openings behind all of the tools, and Peter Main has already remixed a part to do just this. As the internal temperature rises, I'll be keeping an eye on errors for the heated bed MCU, and if necessary, printing this actively cooled case from iPen 3D. So definitely some room for improvement, but already a huge leap in capability from the standard printer for only a quarter of the price of the official enclosure. This enclosure isn't the only modification that I've made in time for this video, and the need comes from the spare beds sitting in between my other printers. There's a few to choose from, but I went for this three plate version from Surfalex 2000, a prolific modifier of the Prusa XL. We have a left and a right solid piece that sits on top of the Z stepper motors on each side. There's cutouts to mount the system in either a forward or rearward position, and I went for the rearward one to give me a little bit of extra clearance with the enclosure. This also lets you use optional T-nuts into the back of the XL frame to cut down on any potential vibration. The combination of these fasteners makes everything feel really solid, and the fact that the sheets have a slight curve in them as they're inserted stops them from vibrating and generating any additional noise. And there's pretty much no loss of Z travel either, as they're not as tall as this metal bracket. Here is the bed being lowered down to the full 360mm, and as you can see, the top bed is just touched. For a full-sized print, I just need to remove that one sheet. This replacement XL now has 162 hours on it without a print failure. Well, apart from one annoying thing. Twice, I've had the start of a print fail from the nozzle cleaning process, just like the original printer did. What is that process? Well, you're seeing it now. The nozzle touches down, just like auto bed leveling, and I can only guess that the aim is to get any bits of filament off the nozzle and onto the bed before probing. But clearly it's a point of failure, so I wanted to address this. And to do so, I chose this nozzle wiper using Bamboo Lab parts from Dan. We bolt it to the front of the bed, and then modify the start G-code with the sequence found on printables, and here's the result in action. Instead of touching the bed, we have a fast and reliable process to clean the nozzle before auto bed leveling. It makes you wonder why something like this wasn't designed in from factory. I'm satisfied regardless, but for this price, I am ecstatic. So what to next? Well, I'm still not happy with the side mounting and loading of the filament, so I'm going to build the Sicko dry box and include the Sunlu S4 dryer modification. This will extend the PTFD tubes at the back, but it should give AMS-like operation and filament storage. I purchased the XL because I wanted it to be a forever printer that could do things that none of my other printers could. I am committed to that, so let me know in the comments just how silly I am being in taking it this far. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.